Here on today's episode is one of India's most talented authors. She's very unique, retailer of myths and epics, New York Times bestseller, a writer, a teacher, a cat lover, eccentric, an illustrator, and the most wonderful Samita Arni. Her works on Indian mythology are engaging, entertaining, and explored in the novel and unconventional wisdom. Through her writing, she has expressed not only her willingness to question the age-old dogmatic beliefs that stem from our most well-known epics, but also her enthusiasm in introducing us to alternate literary works that are lesser known, yet incredibly relevant to our value system. The Missing Queen, Sita's Ramayana, The Prince are some of her best works and they are available on Amazon. Having lived in Pakistan and Afghanistan at different points in her life, she brings a broad cultural perspective and an open-mindedness that we can all learn from. This feminist icon is someone you definitely want to watch out for. And in this episode, you will get to know the amazing mind behind the amazing pen. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey Sam, thank you so much. This is such a pleasure to have you in my show. Um, I've been a ardent follower of your journey, and not just me, my daughter, and pretty much everybody in my house. Um, this is something uh, that I've had, I think, for close to six, seven years, and I think you visited the school. And uh, I have two autographs here. Oh, so there's one autograph which uh, my daughter knew that I love illustrations and graphics oh. and you signed this for her <laughs> oh god with the misspelling of your name i can see uh, that. that must be her uh, <laughs> because she was much younger and she um i don't know if she had a spelling thing and then there was a signature for oh. adia as well which says adia start writing so oh, okay. thank you it's such a privilege to have you in my show oh, thank you so thank much you. thank you for having me here <laughs> <laughs> so sam let me start with you know all great stories start with the beginning um, and you especially I think there's a lot of wisdom in your writing there's a lot of uh, your own self opinion and your individuality that comes in your writing so and while we all grow up in a similar sort of environment of sorts um, there's a uniqueness to how you have evolved have you grown so show me uh, walk me through what childhood was like and who are some of your biggest influences early in your early years Oh, sure. Um, my childhood was an interesting one. Um, my father is, uh, was an Indian diplomat, um, so we traveled extensively. And I was born in India, but first two years in Indonesia. Then we came back for two years to India. Then we ended up in Pakistan when I, when I was about five, four or five. Uh, so all over the place, uh, very uprooted constantly. And I think being an Indian child growing up in Pakistan was a very complicated experience, and that's probably what led me to be a writer, um, and, and that shaped my journey in many ways. Uh, but I think in, in that time, my um, my role models were, of course, my grandmother, um, who, who told me lots and lots and lots of stories. But my other major role models came from the books that I read. I was one of these, you know, traveling constantly uh, you end up sort of becoming a little introverted and a little insular. Mm. And uh, as a shy, kind of socially anxious child, uh, you and I mean, I found my friends and my heroes and my role models in the books I read. Mm. Yeah. I, can, I can relate to both, right? Uh, having grandmother as an influence. I think one of the things I strongly believe in is over the years, we as Indians... Um, have evolved in the stories that we listen from our grandparents, especially the mothers, the grandmothers, and the great grandmothers, and that's evolved, right? And in some ways, they're bringing in their value system through those stories. Um, how is that? How has that evolved for you? What kind of stories were being told? Did you question them, or was that early on um, as part of your upbringing itself? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I think what happened with such a disrupted childhood is that you're exposed to so many different kinds of thinking. So you're constantly kind of forced to compare and question. And I'm you know, naturally curious. So I don't 
and fortunately having parents who let me question everything. Mm. So when my grandmothers would tell me stories and there were these implicit value systems and belief systems, I did take it with a pinch of salt. Mm. Um, so the epics that I grew up with, but the Mahabharata and the Ramayana and the first form of those is, is told by your you know, grandmother. Mm. Um, that's, that was my case. But uh, when I actually read these books for myself, I was, I really strongly questioned the Ramayana. And mm. that was what led me to the Mahabharata, sort of feeling, um, associating more strongly with that. I'm, in, in fact, in the introduction to that book, I talk about how I, I don't want to get into the Ramayana at yeah. all. And then lo and behold, fast forward 20 years later, and I have written two versions of the yeah. Ramayana myself. Yeah. So that was quite ironic. But... The reason that the, the Mahabharata uh, appealed to me was because I could resonate with the characters and the, my favorite character. And I realized that I'm not alone in this preference. Many, many people um, seem to like this character as Karna, mm. who is also someone who is who doesn't quite belong. Mm. Uh, he is uh, a Pandava by birth, but doesn't. this is a secret. And then he's best friends with the Kauravas and... I mean, I'm putting it in child terms because that's how I saw yeah, it. Yeah. And for me, that was very much like the situation I was growing up in. Like, I mm. was born in Indian. I had an Indian passport. But there I was growing up in Pakistan. And my best friends were all yeah, Pakistanis. Pakistanis. And then I come back to India. And I'm not entirely accepted because I've just come from Karachi. So the complexities of dealing with that, I felt that the story and that character particularly spoke to me, particularly resonated with me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And And... To the latter part of the um, conversation, you also talked about being a shy and introvert sh child. Um, and, and for me, I can again relate to that because I'm a very shy and introvert sh uh, child and books and, you know, uh, really play a pivotal role in this. Um, how did that evolve for you from, from just hearing the stories to, oh, I want to write a book now? I don't think that I really set out with the desire of saying I'm going to be a writer and write a book. Mm. What happened kind of spontaneously was, you know, how children play. And I think my form of play was to create little books for myself and my mother would staple them and I would feel very pleased with myself. Um, but it wasn't really, it was just a childish activity. Like, you know, how you play, you play with dolls mm. uh, and you kind of imitate your parents or whatever. Mm. It was the same, similar kind of imitation. And uh, at some point, I think what really happened, I we'd come back to India and I had read the Mahabharata and I'd read many, many versions of it. And it was like this family, you know, party trick. Mm. Let's ask Sam how much he knows about the Mahabharata. And I would just sit there and, you know, they'd ask me all these questions and I'd answer because I kind of, you know, just, just absorbed everything, memorized everything. And uh, then, you know, they were trying to keep me occupied and mm. I'm not the kind of child who wants to, who goes out easily and makes friends and stuff like that. So... Wow, he gave me a book and a diary and I just started writing the Mahabharata. It was just that kind of activity. So and was journaling part of your... Not really, in fact. the the So I struggled with that and then my grandmother came and she said, I'll help you write this down. So mm. I would I would just dictate sentences and then mm. once I got used to that, I started doing it myself. Mm. Um, so it really evolved from that process. And, and from there, I think very early on, you got into the publishing world, understanding of the publishing world. Uh, was that pivotal to also sort of decide, oh, I want to be a writer in the long run? Uh, so it, the, the publishing thing happened kind of accidentally. My mother's friend walked into my living our living room, saw me writing and said, oh, this is really nice. But show it to my friend who's just started a publishing house. Lo and behold, she accepts it and says, we'll publish this. And then I actually had to finish writing it, which was a pain. Mm. Uh, you had a deadline. Then. I, then I had a deadline, my first deadline. Uh, <laughs> and oh my God, do I still struggle. Uh, I don't, and I didn't want to be a writer after that. I published this book. It got a lot of attention. You know, this, you know, obviously an 11 year old writing a book, some, yeah. you know, the, the, the newspapers and the magazines latch onto it, got interviewed a lot. And I felt deeply uncomfortable. Mm. I didn't like the attention. Mm. I didn't feel comfortable with the attention. I, I was a, I'm an insular child. I was an insular introverted child. I wasn't social and yeah I didn't like that but and then also then you know later on when I was 15 you know have I did a book tour in Switzerland and while that was in some ways a very it was a great growth experience it was also very difficult you know being 15 and being away from your family for like a month mm. and, um, you know doing all of these book talks and you have like a much older audience sitting in front of you and um, you're, you're meeting you're going to schools and talking to kids who are just your age mm. And the feeling of difference and mm. how that creeps in mm. when you really just want to belong. Mm. So uh, those experiences were challenging. And I was like, at the, at the end of it, I was like, I don't want to be a writer. I just want to be something else. 
but I came back to it. I think when I was uh, when I I was in another job. I was actually I, I studied film and I ended up working in the film industry initially. And one of the directors I was working for said, "You're a much better writer than you are an assistant to me." <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of was like so okay, it was uh, right there on your face. I was <laughs> like okay. <laughs> So then I got back into um, working in pu- magazine publishing and then in publishing proper, and that did shape has shaped part of my journey. But it's also been all over the place, right? Interesting. Yeah. So early on, Pakistan, studying in Pakistan, what are some cultural differences you saw as a child that you can remember as a child? You know, go- growing up in Pakistan and then growing up in India. So I think there are many things that. common which is a like the num- the kinds of movies we watched mm. uh like everyone in their news you know we watched the same movies across mm. uh, culture but i also had a very limited experience there i went to the something that was called the karachi american school which was filled with other diplomatic kids mm. i lived a very different lifestyle because i was the child of a diplomat and you know i was going to this posh school and everyone lived this posh lifestyle and uh, you know the situation there was very different so some of my some of the kids would come because they came from very influential families they'd come to school with bodyguards mm. and my mother was horrified because i knew the difference between an ak47 and an mi6 when i was 5 mm. and i asked her why don't i have a bodyguard with a gun also <laughs> i also want one status symbol ah <laughs> uh, peer pressure <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so uh, that but those i don't think are specific to a culture i mean those are just a, a very different kind of life experience difference mm. uh i do you know it was a very different life um the saudi council i think lived next to us and at some point his house got bombed and i remember waking up in the middle of the night and parts of his house in our house wow um how old were you then what six maybe wow uh one of my one of my cl- uh, schoolmates got kidnapped apparently i witnessed the kidnapping but i have no memory of it so those sorts of things did happen uh but and i when i came but the strangest thing is when i came and of course i knew my father had this job and you know we had an uh, isi outpost outside our house and they'd constantly you know monitor us and there were all kinds of bugs in the house uh, all of our phone conversations were bugged so that was really the environment i grew up in mm. which is not the greatest you know does not breed for so secure attachment mm. uh in that sense when i came back to india and i was really and i you know my mother had was you know constantly talked about how we have a very different life in india we mm. feel secure we mm. feel safe we wouldn't be different we wouldn't feel you know all of this targeted or whatever it is and so we came back and i was expecting all of that mm. and i didn't get it i came to school and um i didn't know the indian national anthem mm. i knew the pakistani national anthem and i'd mm. been singing that for like 3 years of my life yeah. so all of the kids in school made fun of me they gave me this um a nickname called pagal pakistani even though i tried convincing them that i was indian none of them bought it um so it was i did very much feel more like an outsider here than i did there mm. and for me that was the biggest difference that was the biggest surprise uh that there i thought i, w- I was an outsider but i didn't feel as much of an outsider as i was made to feel when i came back here so how did you cope with that i wrote a book <laughs> this is therapy for me <laughs> it's my coping strategy so i think that's a very interesting thing because often times and in this bit about bullying like you know when i was growing up the maximum i have been called I, i have these powered glasses right so they used to call me sword buddy uh, <laughs> like um, and i used to get really pissed off that you know someone strange a uh, total stranger could just tease me or call me names just like that but this is a different level of what one would go through um so did you have some kind of support system to actually also cope through it other than writing or no i think that i mean that's why i'm a writer is that is my support system so in some ways that then led you to probe more into the topics of interest that you had uh to really get into the details i think what writing did and what writing through these characters did was to give voice to emotions that would have been suppressed otherwise within mm. me So there was a lot of like um catharsis that happened in the act of writing. So did not have access to a therapist. That was not the lingo at that time 30 yeah. years ago. Yeah. But um I think writing served that function for me. Yeah, it's still a privileged lingo in India, yeah. isn't yeah. it? <laughs> so 
from your writing, Sam, when you started, it was about the Indian mythology, more about the Ramayana and the Mahabharat. But actually, over the years, you've been exploring some of the other uh, literatures in the mythologies that are more prevalent in the South as well, and also in Southeast Asia. Like you've written about Tara from Buddhism, you've written about the uh, sixth century Tamilian, uh, Tamil uh, literature. How did that start and is that more to really understand a holistic perspective of the story because Ramayana is prevalent all across and I want to understand more or how did that go about? Uh, so I think what emerged, I mean, you know, the Mahabharata is something I read, but the Ramayana is something that also has traveled across cultures and that was something that I could uh, relate to in each of the places that I lived mm. as a child. Um, Indonesia has the the Wayang Kulit, the, yeah. the shadow puppet tradition of the Ramayana is hugely popular. Then Mahabharata too, but the Ramayana, Ramayana much, much more. Yeah. And that is a, you know, predom I mean, that is a majority Muslim country, yeah. which has the Ramayana, which has this, placed this great cultural importance on the Ramayana. You go to uh, Pakistan and the Lahore comes actually, is derived from Lavapuri, the city mm. of Prince Lava. So mm. there is also that mm. associated there. You, I mean, I've then, my dad got posted to Thailand and, mm. You know, you still have your, your we have King Rama 10, I think, yeah. on the throne right yeah. now. So the Ramayana is still very much a living epic, a living story that, that shapes so much of um, leadership and our expectations in those in that country. So I saw the kind of civilizational impact that the Ramayana had left and uh, how it had happened across cultures and across um, countries, but also how it shifted and was different in each region. Mm. So I think that really interested me. Uh, as I kind of like uh, trying to understand that, trying to grapple with that, trying to even see kind of a unity in my own experiences. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I'm. I also am. You know, I was a I was a reader, so I just read compulsively as a child. It was it was OCD kind of, mm. uh, just to collect all of this mythology and to collect all of um, these stories. So that's also how it it happened. Yeah. So did uh, research as a art. Uh, come in naturally for you at, at a very young age because you were surrounded by books and you were intrigued because back then you didn't even have Google yeah. so it was all books and so you had to research you had to sort of connect from one article or book that you read to the next and research further how did research evolve for you actually that yeah, yeah I mean you uh, I've never asked been asked that question before but now that you mention it 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 was there was no difficulty ever. As long as I could get the book mm. and I could read it, mm. I was sorted. Um, so that happened kind of organically. Mm. And I and I realized that it's actually a great advantage even now to, you know, in, in or whenever I'm learning something new, the fact that I can absorb information very quickly and from multiple sources is really helpful. And do you then, what kind of mechanisms do you use to really capture some of these uh, because you know it's the information influx right because you're reading so many different things um, how do you then pivot and say okay this is the angle that I'm going to research more on it's an interesting question I mean of course you're, you're one is taught all of these kinds of research method methodologies in school and college and I guess those do come in useful when I'm doing some stuff but I think it for me, I just, I love collecting knowledge. So I don't mind if it's off topic or if it's too much. I just absorb, absorb, absorb. And then someday, like later on down the line, it sort of falls into place. Mm. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when you travel, like you, you talked about being in Indonesia, you, be, you talked about being in Thailand. Um, do you go about understanding their mythologies or uh, then identify the right books and authors? Um, how do you go about, does travel influence you in a lot of ways and bring, uh, widening your perspective? Absolutely, but I think it, it happens retrospectively. Mm. Um, so I'm living in, the, I lived in Thailand for three years and I have an understanding of how the Ramayana shaped that culture. I mean, you go to the airport, it's called Suvarna Bhumi. <laughs> so, like the land of the pure. Mm. Um, so, and then later on, you kind of piece it together. And, you know, when I was doing my Ramayana research, then, you know, many things fell into place. But it, it happened retrospectively. I mean, similar, I lived in Italy for two years. And now I find the Renaissance a really interesting kind of thought model about mm. how creativity, business, money, you know, social systems, all of these things come together. Um, 
And uh, but that is also retrospective. Now I, you know, I, I, at least I have the reference of all of that Renaissance art that I've seen of Florence, of of Venice, of what what those kinds of um, cities were like. And uh, then I kind of can piece it together with what I read. Yeah. And do you also do then a comparison of various um, cultures and literature as well to yeah. say um, these are aspects that are very common? Um, whereas these are what uniquely defines this culture. Do you see that um, as well? As a yeah, that comes uh, also organically. Like, I think one of the most interesting things about Florence is the fact that the Medici invested so much in uh, building public infrastructure, like uh, yeah. the Duomo, the, the cathedral, or these great works of art. But they weren't just for great works of art, they were. You also, you're building this place as a, as a it's, it's an investment in the future. Mm. Um, it's also a status. It is also a narrative for everybody else. It is also a public works program because you, you have to employ all of these people. So you're generating, it's an economic you know, generation method. So all of these things are com coming together. And you see a parallel with that, with the kind of way that the great temple complexes were built across South India and Southeast Asia. There was all economic storytelling, creativity, all of these things, performance, because temples were places of performance. Uh, all of these, you know, these, these things seem to happen mm. uh, the, this is a kind of a uh, phenomena mm. that happens across culture mm. so like if you look at the work i mean you see you think of a uh, a poet king like mahindra varman pallava mm. and so that's also very interesting if you delve into south south asian south indian history is to see the kind of poet king as an interesting template for leadership just as the medicis were in template for patron mm. uh, the uh, Mahindra Varman Pallava, Krishna Devaraya, they were all men who invested hugely in building these great temple complexes. Mm. They also were poets in their own right. Mahindra Varman Pallava was also an artist, an archi uh, architectural Architect genius, yeah. a, a musician. So he was a really Renaissance man, mm. in, to use the word of that, that, that came out through the Renaissance. So was Krishna Devaraya. Mm. Um, I think the abilities of these men to do diverse things, um, to be kind of polymaths, is what inspires uh, and creates these cultures of creativity that lead to these kinds of great economic moments. And in, and in, in this journey, what I also see is uh, there's a progressive path for man and there's a journey for a woman through this. Um, as a woman yourself and having gone through this, you know, living it in different countries, What's that journey as a woman for you? Do you see that differently in different cultures? Um, has that been instrumental in you writing more about uh, Sita's Ramayana and the perspective from a woman's uh, point of view? Uh, absolutely. And I think even my uh, the concept of gender is still evolving for me. Mm. So de definitely the, the feeling of being, I, I felt as a child, because I was a girl, very much excluded from power systems excluded, uh, limited choices, huge boundaries compared to what uh, a boy in my place could go out and achieve and do, even come when it comes to safety, traveling. We, we grew up with that. That was our, that was our shared reality as, as women in this country. Um, so that really did shape something like Sita's Ramayana uh, and the anger and the resentment. And, I, and to also find that there was a resonance in the way other women had retold the Ramayana through centuries um, mm -hmm. was that moment for me hugely important. I think the Tamil epics were really also important in that way because the, both the, the, the way we look at the mainstream Mahabharata and Ramayana is as a men's journey. Yeah. You know, these princes who go off to war and accomplish great deeds. But the Tamil epics offer a very different kind of a journey. It's the story of Kannagi or Mani Mekalai or uh, you know, Neela Kesi, who are women who change the society they live in. Mm. But it's very different. It's a very different arc. They're not princes. So it's a. It's also like a conversation that's happening across cultures, across gender, across power dynamics and power paradigms. The Mahabharata and the Ramayana is restoring the rightful ruler. Mm. Uh, Kannagi and Mani Mekalaya are about showing that you know these right. these monarchies don't work. Mm. So that's really interesting conversation too. And so was that? Um, there's a, there's a there's a nuance. There's a subtle nuance in your storytelling. Um, there's simplicity as we were talking about this before the show as well there's a certain level of simplicity and yet there's the perspective from a woman's point of view and it's very beautifully written um, pretty much all your blogs as well as your books have that uh, core essence um, 
And I'm thinking that's got to do with your journey and your reading or your research around uh, these aspects. Is that something thereby then becomes very important that we actually talk about in schools as well? From a woman's perspective, what is it like? Yes, I think it is. But I also feel like for me, even this perspective is changing. Um, you know, Sita's Ramayana and the Missing Queen both came out of a gendered perspective mm. of really being writing as a woman mm. and writing about what this epic has sort of molded or reflects kind of cultural beliefs uh, that, that still influence our lives about what it means to be a woman. But now with The Princess, I wrote from the perspective of a man and about a man writing about a woman. Mm. So that was really interesting. Mm. An entitled, privileged man writing about mm. a not so entitled, privileged woman. Mm. That was a very interesting experience for me to go into. And, th- and that also showed me that there is a path of transcending these distinctions. Absolutely. And then that is very powerful when you find voices mm. like that. Yeah, mm. you don't all, you, Even in the past, we are not necessarily, our perspectives are not necessarily bound by our gender or mm. by the kind of power places we're born into. Uh, Ilango Adigal, who is the author of the Sila Patikaram, who writes the story of Kandagi, is born a prince and chooses to renounce that. Mm. So that I felt was very powerful. Mm. That he, a prince, a man, writes the story of a woman who, you know, is the cause of death to a king. So I think that was also another moment of shift for me. And now I find myself in, in a different space because I was, I've been teaching for the last two weeks. Um, and my classes, this time we had a number of students, uh, you know, now we are starting to ask about pronouns and that's becoming increasingly important yeah. and necessary as well. So in this class, I think it was the first time I asked, every, we, we asked everyone what, and this was a class decision, what their pronoun was and how they'd like to be addressed. And that opened up a huge space of discussion uh, and a very complicated space as well, uh, but fascinating as well. I've, so I've identified as uh, a woman, and it's probably still do. I come from a certain generation where that sort of what, you know, your gender identity was just something you were given, accepted. Yeah. This generation is saying, no, we have the right to choose it. Yeah. We have the right to identify as something else. And uh, that's also opened up a huge space in my own mind. And I'm like, yeah, I guess I express myself. I seem, I look like a woman, but in my own head, if gender is a construct, am I a man or a woman or am I a bit of both? And in, in my head, I'm, I'm both. Both, yeah. yeah. I was just, uh, as you were speaking, I was like thinking, what am I? Yeah. And I think it's both because yeah. you bring in flavors of both, I guess, um, both in the way you think, the way you act. Yeah. Yeah. So... In this process, um, you know, from your first book to the current uh, journey that you're in, has your perspective about um, our culture or the deep-rooted value system changed? Uh, because in the book you talk about uh, both Mahabharata as well as Sita, um, Ramayan and how you're more influenced by Mahabharata. So you like Mahabharata more because... Um, it's more thrilling, there are wars and there's a bigger story around it, uh, whereas Ramayana is written in a more ideal world sort of a scenario. You also do a comparison in another, I think, in the article or I read it somewhere else where about Sita and Draupadi, um, where one is looked at as more stronger, and but eventually you've evolved in your storyline about Sita as well. So how has that changed in from a perspective, perspective uh, point of view for you over the years. You're, you're asking whether my ex- perspective on the char- the gender character... Yeah, yeah, on the characters itself, like, you know, from Adraupadi to Sita, yeah. uh, to the current new age woman. Um, there are things that we've evolved. How has that changed for you from as a child who wrote this book to the current uh, Sam? Uh, yeah. How has that evolved for you? Uh, I think when I read um, the Ramayana, you know, you, you felt sad for Sita. Like she was banished and like excluded. And oh my God, poor thing. She didn't really deserve that faith. But now I actually see that moment of banishment. And, and you've, it's been struggled with this when Ram came back and said, you know, come back to Ayodhya and, you know, with love and cushion me. And she's like, no, mm. I ain't going back. Mm. I'm going back in the earth. Mm. I actually find that really, and it felt like a sad thing. Oh no, why didn't she end up with a happily ever after? But the happily ever after is also a very Western civilizational idea. Yeah. Um, and there is no happily ever after for Sita and the Valmiki Ramayana. That's something I think many people struggle with. 
for me that's evolved into saying actually that there is a moment of resistance you have this character sita who's sort of you know she's followed her husband around she's sacrificed she's lost out she's got she has had to prove her chastity in public and she's like enough i ain't doing this anymore that's quite powerful i yeah. and you see that happening so if i sort of put a parallel and you you write beautifully about the old mythology with a new age storytelling thing right uh, like the queen's uh, story is a classic case where it's written in the current um, timeline um so my question here is if i do a parallel to the description of sita that we just talked about to the modern the current women out there uh, or or just to myself right um you're a mother you're a wife you're an individual you're a sister you're a daughter each one has different roles and you make choices as you progress over here and over generations our women have actually made these choices to for us to be who we are today um how is this going to evolve into an equal world what would cause it to what are some of the drivers that would bring an equality equality out there equal world in what sense just in terms of gender mm. like everything right like why 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 do we have to make choices why do we have to be the kinds who are sacrificing just because we have yeah. to make it work um marriage is also talked about as um adjustment and compromises whereas ideally it should just be uh, an equal world um so what are things what are some of the key drivers knowing this historical transformation we've gone through what are some key drivers um that would really make it a more equal world for us i think a eh, the the emergence of this large percentage of the young population saying they don't want to be gender binary mm. they don't want to live in a gender binary world i think that will be fundamental that the moment we start accepting that these are just things in our heads we can break out of these scripts that we've been given from childhood we can choose what we want to be how we want to act that i as a as a woman i don't always have to sacrifice i don't always have to be nurturing i can throw a tant it's not generally advisable to throw a tantrum in the boardroom mm. but i can do that as much as any man mm. um i still probably wouldn't throw a tantrum in the boardroom but uh <laughs> there are easier ways of getting the same thing done uh, <laughs> that's my experience as a woman but yeah i think i think that is a big shift and i while we also have felt that women have been powerless mm. for you know centuries i think it is there is also a strange advantage it has given us and i'm really seeing that clearly now when i look at my own life and the life of some of my male friends and relatives um there was there's this interesting article that i read which talked about how evolution because women were powerless mm. or or did not they had to sort of be more emotionally intelligent they had to develop more greater emotional intelligence to figure out the which way the wind was blowing and to work with that i think that's something we've all developed right you can sense the emotional atmosphere of a room you'd know how to push things around with that and create consensus mm. i am seeing that emerging as a very important in different spaces um now even so that you know that this is an advantage that a woman is uh, been even brought up to be more emotionally aware than a you know than a boy is or a man is that can be a huge asset in one's career so also i think what will shift it is to to look at what we've also gained mm. and to use those strengths what mm. was weakness can actually what was considered weakness mm. can actually become a strength if you know how to play it right um and i think that will level the playing field hugely a big part of that is also while i'm emotionally able to um sort of observe and grasp this and really make decisions based on that it's also about how to handle power play right um and we've seen that whether it is in our epics or even in the real world out there right now power play is a big part of it right how do we as women get through this journey. oh my god i was dealing this really recently i had to like do a financial negotiation and you know how financial negotiations are with people you don't know and who don't come from the same you don't think that they come from the same level like or the same kind of thought system that you do and you're like i know i have to just do a power play just to like make sure that the financial negotiation works i don't really want to do this but okay i'm going to do it uh, that happens i don't know if you've been in that yeah, situation yeah, yeah? yeah and you're like i'm going to do this completely like 
pointless power play on some level yeah. simply because i need to assert yeah. certain control of the situation and then hopefully once that control is established you can move past that but yeah like we have to also accept that you know and i was feeling like oh my god i'm such a bad person for you doing this power play but that i also was sort of this conditioning right yeah. good girls don't do don't this don't do this yeah and i was like okay i'm going to be bad yeah. i'm going to be a bitch it's okay yeah, yeah. so you, what, what you're also saying and i totally agree with you is you know you don't have to be always nice yeah you don't have to be always about oh what um and take care of every other aspect and then decide for yourself you have to think for yourself first oh my god yes right yeah. uh, because by nature we are the kind who really think about family children everything else and then decide for yeah. what's best we we always um prioritize the relationship over our own selves and do you see that would be a game changer as well where you become in some ways for lack of better words a little more selfish yeah but we can also think of it differently like when you were talking i mean earlier i hope it's okay to allude yeah. to that conversation yeah. uh, but your own uh, relationship of how your your husband and you had developed complementary roles and how that had you know, sort of impacted you positively even in your own growth professionally yeah um i felt that that's that's a powerful game changer right yeah. you can sort of see you see your relationships as enabling you in fulfilling your purpose i mean okay that's fundamentally selfish yeah but that can be a game changer yeah. Yeah. yeah we're here we have we are we have as much right to be here as any man or other person and uh, the i choose relationships um, that empower me or that help me grow yeah. and or i choose to work through them in ways that help me grow and and in your uh, teaching experience i know you go to schools and talk about it um does this then become very pivotal for us to have a storytelling where we talk about these nuances to girls but at the same time also there's a different kind of story we need to be also talking to our boys about right yeah. to be able to sit across and have a conversation of that kind and to be able to accept complimenting capabilities in a marriage in a relationship etc or even in a workplace you need to mold the minds of both boys and girls differently isn't it or am i just wait i don't think you need to mold anyone that's the problem is that we've molded people for too long we haven't let them be themselves um and i sometimes i'm surprised when children are given the freedom to be themselves mm i am shocked mm. they are far more evolved than i have mm. and i and i remember this because i and i think the mahabharat actually you know writing it as a child and then being an adult who has to go to schools and talk about it this is a great learning experience because i'm supposed to be there at the head of the classroom telling them stuff but mm. actually what i what happens is i learn from them and i think this you know earth shattering moment happened to me maybe about 10 years ago mm. when i was in a classroom with a bunch of like 8 or 9 year old kids and they were in international school mm. but very interesting perspective and there was uh, i was telling them the story of ganga and shantanu and how they met and you know how bhishma was born And it's very interesting. Is, is that the leaf thing? Yeah. No, no. That's 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 Satyavati. Okay. But Ganga and Shantanu, as one of my students has described it, and I would, um, if you know, somebody else would really call me out on 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 saying this. But is the example of a, the both Ram and Sita and Ganga and Shantanu are examples of marriages that don't exactly work perfectly, <laughs> and both have moments of sep- long periods of separation, right? Yes. So Ganga does leave Shantanu, and that is a marriage that doesn't work out. Mm. And uh, in this class, for some reason, the, the discussion pivoted to why this relationship hadn't worked out. Mm. And uh, this little boy says, "Well, Ganga, you know, she put all these conditions down." and shantanu accepted i mean very superficial he didn't get to know her first he should get to know her first he should get to know her personality he was just looking at her and thinking she's very beautiful and i should marry her that's not a great decision and then i and i don't understand how a person like that can be king if they're making decisions like this which is brilliant from a child uh and then he also said um but also that ganga putting down conditions i mean how can you make a relationship work with conditions you have to have trust I'm like shocked. I'm like I have never thought about this, you know. Uh that of course, I mean I I'm used to parroting this kind of epic that I've been taught, but here is this child who's so insightful, who's making me rethink the way I look at it and 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 think of the Mahabharata as a lesson in relationships that work and don't work. Yeah. Very important for me yeah. at that age yeah. to learn about as well. Yeah. Yeah. So in some ways the, what we are also talking about is more than molding 
there's some bit of unlearning that we have to go through <laughs> because as kids uh, i i can mm. relate to this like as my daughter was growing up um the questions were very straightforward and sometimes it makes you think yeah huh, why did i think this way why didn't i have that perspective when did that change um so in some ways it's also about unlearning some of this to let that learning journey from the child's point of view yeah, to yeah. evolve where the children right? teach us right yeah, yeah yeah i think we have to unlearn yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and or, or let them show us the way they want to go is that what you're driving as a purpose as well um in some ways sam in terms of your stories or the storytelling that you've got you've taken is to really help in this unlearning journey and to relearn some of these fundamental things that really define value for us i guess so i mean one could see it that way but i also see a uh, value is something that we're projecting onto these stories they can be read so differently mm. there are multiple interpretations possible we haven't read a bad marriage into ganga and shantanu right for i mean we didn't grow up with that but it is possible to read that yeah. and it is possible to learn that you know like do not marry someone the moment you see them he makes this mistake twice yeah. you you know ganga and he that's why bishma loses out and that's why we we have this old mahabharat in the first place occurring um these lessons there are there is something important and valuable here mm. but you need a new persp- what we've sort of been conditioned into the way we read this mm. and we need to break out of that because these stories still have truths to teach us that lie underneath that conditioning um so i think for me what's important is to realize that we we do need a relationship to tradition mm. we need a relationship to what we have inherited in the past but not in a way that controls us in a way that we learn from it mm. without being conditioned by it mm. i think that's important um that's what preserving culture should be about it shouldn't be about replicating or remaining steadfast to certain cultural ideals that have no context or place in our world today true very true right i want to take you through another aspect as well now um as a writer so you seem to have multiple professional journeys as well you're a writer you did the gra- uh, graphic illustrations um you're into filmmaking script writer a whole bunch teaching a whole bunch of things um at the core of it is also you're an amazing storyteller and i believe any vertical or industry you sort of take um the art of storytelling is the most important um you know skill uh, and especially when it is in uh, whether it's in selling whether it is in influencing another team member there is a feeling that you connect with or an emotion you connect with when a story is told in the right way um help me understand your professional journey how has that evolved how have you been you know connecting these dots together from a book writer to um the current uh, screen writing uh so I, i i still struggle with trying to you know you were asking me earlier like if i had a clarity of purpose and i was like i don't even know what my career is you know i have like some five or six industries that i work in and i and the same skill set or different skill sets in combination with each other is what i employ across these industries i don't quite understand it um but i feel like at at the most basic level of human experience and this applies to the way we think of ourselves the way we think of the culture around us the way we think of our own journey through the world we need narrative we need a way of connecting the past to our present we need to, a way of understanding how we got here hmm. and that is narrative hmm. that is storytelling right hmm. and to see what was important what isn't important what how certain moments make us feel how we introspect on these moments um what we feel what emotions brought us here uh that and once you combine storytelling and that narrative with emotions and you're able to incite that in another person you have the power of persuasion mm. so i think storytelling is really important to create a uh, a way of communicating easily between ourselves uh reflecting certain truths mm. um sharing when we find um, a shared moment in a character mm. or a shared connection with a character that helps us connect with each other mm. so i f- i feel like on the the most basic level of it storytelling is about connection between past and present between each other um between uh, customer and client um i mean client and you know the, the creator so all of these things um are really about connections and the way we we, we create those connections 
taking a quick break from our conversation today i wanted to quickly talk about our collaboration partner hubhopper this podcast was created on hubhopper studio if you wish to start your own podcast for free please visit www.hubhopperstudio.com Hubhopper is India's leading podcast creation platform. Start your podcast with Hubhopper Studio and get your voice heard um, across platforms like Spotify, Ghana, Google Podcasts, Wink Music and many more. Click on the link in the episode description to or visit hubhopperstudio.com. Thank you Hubhopper for the collaboration and now we go back to our conversation. So if someone is really starting on the art of storytelling, on the journey of storytelling, what are some tips that you would give as to how do you structure this journey? I don't know if you can. <laughs> I wanted to be an astrophysicist. This was my, my 11th choice. <laughs> well, you still have a life yeah, yeah. ahead of you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the astro- astrophysics has been ruled out a little bit. But um, <laughs> I find quantum theory kind of fascinating um but how how would what i what would i tell to someone who wants who is an aspiring storyteller and i think the reason i ask this is i think it applies to pretty much everybody it do- mm-hmm. doesn't matter which industry you're working in um storytelling is a big crucial part of a career journey as well right so if i have to start telling my story I think open yourself up to the vast unknown. This is the feeling that's coming to me. Mm. Uh the the thing about when you start shaping a narrative or when you start telling a story you suddenly realize that it's bigger than you mm. and you are just a tiny person who's holding it. Mm. I felt that particularly you know with these first two books the Mahabharata and Sita's Ramayana I suddenly there were moments when I felt overwhelmed by the success of these two books and I was just like I'm this tiny person who's holding the story and I just wrote about what I connected with it and suddenly everyone else is connecting with it too. and oh god I, i this is so much pressure but also this is so much opportunity for friendship hmm. and to meet companions like minded companions on the journey so to really see the journey of storytelling as that to build connection to find yourself through your writing find this part of you that you didn't know existed to bring that out and share that with others and you will find that same self in them hmm. and that bond that sense of community that sense of connection is that's what it's all about that's that's why we do it so it starts off if i get it right it also starts off first with letting go yeah right uh, whether it is letting oh, go of storytelling is a complete home, right? act of surrender like you you write a character and then you have to let the character figure out their own destiny you cannot tell them i want you to walk that path mm. they'll figure out their own okay, that destiny for themselves so they're almost living in that sense interesting Yeah. And 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 in this process, because you're also touching on the emotional side and the feelings aspect, that's where the connect happens, and so that's where the build of trust happens as well. Did I sort of get it right as well? Yeah, uh, yeah. Feel. I think feeling. I mean, I think the moment you start saying that, I have felt shy, mm. and you suddenly like, oh, I have also felt shy. Yeah, there is connection there. Yeah, right. Yeah. So. how we if i came to you said yeah i'm a really successful writer mm. and like i did this but this is not the truth mm. this is also fake mm. uh, you might people aspire to that but they don't connect with that mm. i don't want to be someone or no one you, you know you have this incredibly successful life as well yeah. but we what we want is to be intimate or to share ourselves mm. right mm. more than anything else mm. to be seen for who we really are so genuinity in storytelling yeah. Yeah. comes yeah. through that thing yeah. of letting go and being open to really yeah. absorbing more and then connecting on a personal front or a feelings yeah. aspect and then taking it forward yeah but how do you keep the thrill in the story continuing the unex- well all stories are predictable yeah i watch a story i can i mean i watch any netflix thing i can tell you the ending right away yeah. so the story will always be <laughs> you know the story is going to end up this way or that way but i think what makes it different is the level like yeah i'm the the level of intimacy you can give it mm. the the way you also portray an emotional experience i think what we want to feel is close to those characters we mm. want to lose ourselves in them for a little while mm. so creating that that's so does that mean being vulnerable as well oh hugely yeah yeah but that's something we don't do often we're not comfortable with right yeah. 
yeah absolutely. You, you take the plunge there yeah, that's I, okay and i think creativity is about being vulnerable mm-hmm. and accepting the fact that not everyone might agree with you and you will be criticized and there will be people who feel like they could have done it better than you did yeah so in this journey as you went through this um there's been success and there's been early success for you um how about failure how have oh, you so seen much failure, failure. <laughs> because when we talk about vulnerability when we talk about the ups and downs of storytelling there's going to be critiquing there's going to be you're going to be almost naked out there in the world no. and so how do you deal with failure how do you deal with critiques how do you deal with some of these negative aspects or is it even negative well i mean one is also you have to develop your own sense of uh, internal kind of judgment system where you say this criticism is important that criticism is completely irrelevant so you have to also develop that level of trust in yourself mm. uh when it comes to criticism and and letting and hearing it mm. yeah this is valid this is not valid mm. um so that's important but i think the other thing is for me i find my failures more important than my successes uh my successes are like yeah you did it so uh, what next yeah right Move it's on. kind of boring yeah. almost right i yeah. i don't know if you feel that way yeah, about yeah, success yeah absolutely that. and that's why yeah. you sort of you know move on to the next one yeah. i'm going to explore this now i'm interested in this yeah. Yeah. i i made my financial goal okay yeah now yeah. i'll go and hit my fitness goal okay yeah. then what yeah. what next yeah. right and your failures are like oh like i mean how many i might have had some professional success but i've had insane numbers of relationship failures <laughs> insane numbers of relationship failures but can i just say that my all of those failures have led me to become better to be become better not just in relationships i'm still a bit of a failure at them but i have become a better writer because of all of those relationship failures you know it it has forced me to be more in touch with myself more in touch with uh, another person and hold space for both so in some ways you're talking about really experiencing the journey yeah. and absorbing what comes through it so if you can absorb success in a nice way you should also be absorbing the failure aspect but not look at it as like a negative trait but like a stepping stone in the experience journey mm. yeah i find success very uncomfortable actually so recently yeah. it happened to me like um last year i won a prize and i remember so i'll start off i'm i'm also a teacher and yeah. um i i teach at a college here in bangalore and uh So there was a student of mine and she grew phenomenally fast in the class and i was uh you know then sent her one of the short stories she wrote for publication it was accepted so she got published and then as and then there was this creative writing award the toto funds the art award that came up so it's like you got to you got to apply for this and and i re- i had applied for the same award years ago and i hadn't gotten through mm. i i got long listed but i never made it to the short list and i never won and so that failure in the back of my head kind of rankled at me but then the student came up in class and she was like really good and i was like you got to you got to apply for this award and she would like no not really and every day i would like wake up in the morning and send her a whatsapp message saying have you applied have you applied and it's getting late okay if you need courier money to send it by courier because it's really close to the deadline i will give you this money <laughs> you know i was like really like my 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 you know how like parents sometimes put their expectations yeah. on their children i'm yeah. like that with my students sometimes so anyway she finally applied for it and she won and i remember the moment after she went she was telling me i feel so confused mm. i didn't expect to win am i really worthy of all of these sorts of uncomfortable feelings and her family was there and i was there and we were all crying and we had dinner together it was this moment you know like you this intense bonding moment that happened it was really moving for me um not it was uncomfortable for her but like deeply emotional and moving for me and then fast forward 6 months later i even a prize and i'm sitting there and i'm saying i feel so uncomfortable and she was like ha and she sent me this text message saying i'm so excited for you and i was like i feel so uncomfortable she says ha 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 you know i'm there she had gone ahead of me in that experience yeah. right and i yeah. was learning from her so then i realized like actually it's so much easier when other people succeed yeah. like it's it's just clear i think this is why people have children uh we want our children to succeed more than we do because it's so much like yes i can enjoy this fully oh, god <laughs> when you yourself you're like oh my god my responsibility do i really deserve this what do i do with this you know yeah, but yeah. with your with somebody else whether it's a student or a kid or somebody you're just like it's different and um and then i then so then a couple of uh, weeks ago uh, the nobel prize was announced and someone who had taught me won the nobel prize for literature uh and he'd been a mentor while i did my last novel 
and I was feeling so excited. I was like this this man, and I could I remember because I could really relate to him because I'd been in a class of four people with him, and you know, not all the students were interested, and some of them were really like kind of frustrated, and he was trying to connect with all of us, and I really connected with him, and then I went back to teaching afterwards, and I know I was like I know what this guy feels like, and suddenly this guy, you know, this teacher. Abdul Raza Garna wins the, wins the Nobel. Nobel, yeah. And I was like, I feel so excited. Yeah. And I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And you know, yeah. it's, it's it's so much easier to celebrate somebody else's success. But that what I'm also seeing is, um, and it connects back to the storytelling as well, right? About connecting with people and building the trust. Um, you need to also sort of one surround yourself with folks like to the case of your student and you. If the student didn't have someone like you really believing in the student more than the student believed in themselves, um, that push wouldn't have happened. So you need to be surrounding yourself with the right mindset or, or the right set of people as well. Um, is that something that you've observed through your career journey? Oh, yeah. And I mean, one of the reasons I'm a teacher who believes in her students mm -hmm. is because my teachers did not believe in me for a large part. Mm. And sort of I still, the story of managers and companies. Is <laughs> yeah, and you don't, you aren't believed in and you're suddenly like, oh, well, I'm successful. Uh, and my teacher didn't think I would be. Mm. I mean, some of my teachers, some of my teachers did believe in me, but I do remember the ones who didn't, mm. uh, who failed me and things mm. like that. And, mm. and then you're like, well, if I can achieve this and any of my students, like they can. And I, by God, I know what they've been through in school. I'm going to give this to them. Yeah. Yeah. It starts off with the self-belief as well, yeah. right? Like, very nice. Yeah. And and you also mentioned about the mentors in your life. Um, was that a conscious thing that you always had throughout? That I had good... I was very lucky that I've had some fantastic mentors. Mm. And some of them have been men. Mm. Uh, and um, it's it's also amazing how generous they have been to me. Mm. Uh, and And in fact, I think they have really empowered me on my journey by believing in me in a way that... It's, it's a weird thing, right? Sometimes. Yeah. 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 Like I, as a woman, sometimes I felt that other women have held me down. I was going to ask you this. Uh. <laughs> and then like some really, this really powerful man will suddenly empower me by saying, yes, Sam, you can do this. And yeah. I'm just like, oh, what is happening? I'm so confused right now. This is not. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, that was one question I was going to lead towards as well is, um, there's this thing about, uh, I'm a Mangalorean, right? So it's a very matriarchal uh, background. But there's this whole, uh, it's a very lingual thing that uh, is cracked within, amongst Mangaloreans. If you're in a boat which is sinking and full of Mangaloreans, uh, you will push the others <laughs> and sort of survive. <laughs> but that's not true, like, for example, in, uh, in the Kerala uh, community. I see them like, you know, yeah. giving a hand to help. Um, do you see that uh, cultural difference as well in your journey uh, is d as in different roles as well as in different countries? Yeah, I think also the, the way, I think what shifted with it was my own, under hmm, this is an interesting question. I haven't had reflected much on this, so I can't. So really there's a general belief um, out there. I would like to sort of question it because I've also had some really great women mentors. Uh, but I do yeah. believe that, you know, as women, we don't sort of offer a hand to help someone enough. So I think that comes from that older generation who didn't get much help themselves. Yeah. And so them believing like, okay, you got to do it on your own. Yeah. And that's what's going to make you succeed. Yeah. I get where that comes from. Yeah. But like men did not have that because exactly. they were helped. So they, they'll happily help you also. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so sometimes yeah. it's really weird. Yeah, it works that way. But I've had some fantastic women, women mentors yeah. as well. I mean, yeah. hugely. Um, and I think that's also been hugely. I mean, also them giving me the confidence to be single and do my own thing. So were you reaching out to mentors, or how is mentorship happening for you, Sam? I think it happens kind of weirdly organically. Mm. Um, so I've I was lucky. I mean, the my first real mentor was um, Roberto Colasso, who is this very famous Italian writer who died earlier this year. But he r saw the Mahabharat, uh, a copy of this book, and wanted to publish in Italian. And then I happened to be studying in Italy at the same time. So I went over to meet him. And he's huge in Italy. Mm. He's really like this massive mind. Um, so I, and he was a huge mentor in giving me that kind of confidence and that belief in myself. And I'm really grateful for him. And I will be for the re rest of my life um, grateful for that belief in myself that he encouraged. I remember another mentor in college, um, Joseph Ellis, 
Mm-hmm. And he's really taught me, I mean, I learned from Joseph Ellis how to live an exciting life. Um, he won a Pulitzer. Mm-hmm. And I actually met him in my last semester of college. But he was the one professor who actually helped me get a job. And I realized something like his huge success. And he had also, there was a bit of scandal also attached to him because uh, he taught a class class where he pretended to be a Vietnam War vet and he wasn't. Mm. But that had really engaged his students. So I had students who had come from this huge, this class where they had like this phenomenally shaped change the way I experienced uh, history. Mm. But then it was a scandal because he hadn't he actually hadn't. served in the mm. um, in, in Vietnam, mm. uh, though he had been in the army at that time. So... Uh, but he he lived with that scandal very gracefully. It was like not something that bogged him down. He still enjoyed his life, even though he had been suspended for a couple of years. All of that had happened. Um, and I really learned from him, like, yeah, how to deal with... That would have been somebody else would have seen that as a moment of failure. He kind of... It's also about... Exp- so yeah. there's, there's a creativity out there yeah. in terms of, again... Uh, how do you capture the story? How do you yeah. capture the audience as well? So what you're also talking about is make it spice it up by making it a little more interesting yeah. with the experiences like yeah, with yeah. the experiences yeah, but, uh, of course I, I don't want to ever get suspended from my job so I cannot <laughs> pull that stunt off in my classroom but I think from him like learning that um, what it meant to be a good storyteller mm. and also being able to realize that being a good teacher and he's a phenomenal teacher I was in his classroom and he's also a phenomenal academic that you mm. can marry those two roles mm. um, because I think uh, a lot of people when they're extraordinarily successful they, if they, you put them in a classroom or you put them in a bunch of kids, they're not going to care for those kids yeah. because they're on that pedestal and yeah. they're on that power trip. And the fact that Joe Ellis took so much care of his students, you know, helped me find a job after college. Um, and he's a Pulitzer Prize winner. He didn't have to do that. Uh, I'm like to gracefully live with success. And then that's when the game changer happens when women or it doesn't have to really be women anybody who's trying to climb up the um, yeah. you know career portfolio or any journey there are people who are out there un- yeah. very selfishly or selflessly trying to reach yeah. out and help right? yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think that comes from people who have achieved whatever they wanted to achieve right and they, they, yeah. they, they're like okay I've done it the now what do I do next that they have yeah. and yeah. from that right yeah. and as against a hunger and a yeah. thirst for the next mm-hmm. level um so in this process um one of the things i also see is sam your career portfolio is like it's spread just like mine <laughs> what do we do with our resumes <laughs> it's a very interesting portfolio i mean that's why i call it the portfolio okay. not a career path um how has that been do you just grab any opportunity that comes your way and in the process, it's like you're rediscovering yourself or how do you how do you go about? I think uh, I don't I, I'm really curious to hear, you know, your <laughs> your thoughts on this. But I also feel like life, we were saying you were saying this to me earlier as well. Like life is an experience. Yes. yes we're not going to be stuck hard and fast to the rules of winning and losing or yes. being successful or a failure. Yes. You really are here to experience the gamut yes. that you can during your lifetime. And even when the pandemic happened, like everyone was sitting there and being miserable. And I was like, okay, this is actually kind of an interesting opportunity. Yes. <laughs> How do I reframe this as an opportunity rather than, oh gosh, uh, I just had a book out and oh, God, what am I going to do? Uh, there's no lit fest, there's nothing happening. Okay, I'm going to take this corporate job and I'm going to run with it. And it's actually really fascinating. So that all happened. And to really see every moment like that as, an, as a new adventure, yeah. as a new ad- opportunity, uh, to not be like stuck on like, I'm going to achieve this and I'm going to be this. Yeah. Um, but and, and as you were saying also earlier, that all our experiences eventually integrate. Yes. Right? And Connect. the strengths. Yes. Like being an, I mean... The reason I turned to teaching at some point is I finished my last book. I realized I was completely burnt out. Mm. I did not have another word left in me. Mm. And I needed to make a living. And I had to keep my SIPs going. (laughs) And I had to find a job. And my cats, most importantly, we forget my SIPs. I had two cats who wanted royal canine and not whiskers. And I could only, if I did not get a job, I would only be able to afford whiskers maybe for a couple of months and then they would be like yeah. no food yeah. so rather and then these cats would just wake me up every night because they were refusing to eat yeah. they were eating whiskers they were farty and smelly and I was like I can't ha- deal with this any longer so I have to get them royal canine so I then took up a job that made me travel one and a half hours two, two hours each way by bus so it's about about three to four hour commute every day teaching in Yalahanka 
and i had a and i was exhausted every day but i also had a blast yeah. i i you know i was teaching in the classroom and i thought this was kind of a down downgrade for a teacher for a, for a writer i am no longer successful i have to teach but i was like wow this is the best experience ever yeah I love this. I love my students. I'm so connected with them, and that took me down a different journey. Because you're as much in a learning journey as much as they yeah. are, right? Yeah. So you're uh, you're enjoying that yeah. because you're learning through that process. Yeah, yeah, I can so mm-hmm. relate to this. Yeah. Yeah. And I became best friends with the bus driver Venkatesh, <laughs> who has great footwear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when we talk about learning, it's also about the Jawari window, right? there are things we know about ourselves there are things we don't know about ourselves there are things others perceive mm-hmm. as strengths or weaknesses that we have that we don't know about and there are things that nobody is know aware of um have you in this in the last two decades of your journey of writing and the various um you know parts you've taken rediscovered yourself and expanded your jawari window how has that changed for you because you do have an offbeat career path just like mine yeah. and this would be interesting for folks who have like a defined career path that they're going after to really look at a different perspective itself yeah i mean i don't have it i don't know what's going to happen next it's ambiguous right yeah yeah all i know is like okay financial security was a goal that's kind of okay ish mm. so i'm sorted so let me just experiment with everything else um yeah i one thing is that status or position isn't very important mm. um i remember at some point saying okay if not, if if this career path does not work out well, i i can go and be a kindergarten teacher or i can go be a librarian and i was like actually excited by the thought it's like yes i want to be a librarian mm. um i always wanted to be yeah. a librarian and i think that's the best job yeah <laughs> i mean imagine this, the like for example if you like end up being a ceo of a company and then you're like okay i'm going to retire and be a librarian it's the best yeah. um so i think to really um shift the idea of stat- like status status can be very unsatisfying mm. uh, you've achieved it you've got that thrill of achievement you've earned that whatever uh, i i know a lot of people who earn you know like who um, buy flats and then buy mercedes and buy like bmws and it wears off but that thrill of coming in front of a bunch of like excited 6 year olds every day and reading them stories doesn't yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so th- that's been my experience so i'm a shopaholic just like cat needs <laughs> um the right food uh for me it was all about um you know i've been working so long and you know i deserve something nice and so i've always in one of my blogs i talk about what's your white elephant so for me it's i i went through a journey to discover okay these are not so important it's the other journey of really um the experiences and the learnings from that the joys you get from just connecting so the other strange thing that i discovered by my about myself is that um i love money <laughs> and this was difficult because i was a writer and you know we have this romantic notion of a writer living in a garret yes. you know and i lived in a 1 bhk in adugodi you know on the border of a slum with an uber driver as a neighbor and i was like i was actually having a blast in my life despite how sordid that sounds it was a wonderful moment and i really had a lot of friends and community and all the neighborhood kids would run in and read my books and we had a we had a great time but uh i also realized in that point i love money hmm. and i just love watching money grow hmm. and i had a financial uh, planner um who's a really wonderful lady called priya sundar hmm. so shout oh, out to priya sundar priya, is she is she, oh, is she yeah, also yeah. your financial planner no i i mean uh, no i have a financial planner who actually sends me check this out this ring really looks beautiful oh. <laughs> that's a different relationship you have <laughs> but i've heard yeah, of priya yeah, sundar yeah, yeah. an amazing woman yeah 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 she's really amazing woman and yes. it's really about empowering women through their yes. finances and so i met her at some place and, and i was you know complaining about my life and i was in debt mm. really i had a, a a huge college loan to pay off and i i remember meeting her around that time and um, money can empower us yes. uh, as and i think it's really important for us as women to understand that and understand we're being so uncomfortable and i still struggle with this how uncomfortable i am for asking the money that i'm worth um even feeling like i should be asking for money mm. like why do i need to ask for money i come anyway from some sort of you know upper middle class family uh, i will uh, you know like my parents will look after me worst comes to us so why should i worry about money yeah. but that's actually really hugely problematic because the moment you do that you buy into everyone else's expectations very true uh if you want to create an impact in the world 
I mean, it could be, okay, maybe sometimes you have to go and say, you know, if you have parents who will give you that safety net, yeah, help me make an impact in, in this world. Or I want to do it by being independent on and standing on my own two feet mm. um, and, and, sh- and, and proving to others that this can be done. Mm. So uh, I, money was, was, was hugely important in that, in the sense that I can be a writer. I can experiment with my career because I know that I've saved up enough and I have good enough financial discipline to, to always, you know, that I can invest and that those investments themselves will earn for me. So I think that's hugely important for taking certain creative risks with your life, for choosing an offbeat career journey, for not choosing like the the the, the typical success ideas, uh, understanding also like how real estate uh, appreciates and depreciates. Do you really yeah. need to own a house? Yeah. It can really free you from those things. Do you really need to own a car? Apparently, if you spend less than 600 rupees on Uber a day, which is what I do, I spend far less than that. Do I really need to own a car? Mm. No. Um, mm. So that can really free you. Understanding money can really free you yeah. in many ways. Uh, and I think also just the flow of money. It's yeah. beautiful. And then when I, you know, you when you get huge, you know, like getting huge um, amounts of money for projects used to terrify me earlier. But then I realized, no, I can actually bring on other people yeah. who I love to work with on this and give them money that they deserve to be paid. Yeah. Isn't that the best? So you're actually, yeah. what you're also saying is, oftentimes we go after money with the bad intentions but money can actually bring you happiness in a different way if you really have figured mm. how to and if you've understood how money works and how to make it work for you yeah and it's yeah. very important for us to really understand money from that perspective yeah money can bring joy to certain people like i i i've you know, employed so many of my students after they've graduated on various projects. <laughs> and it, it's so joyous, you know, when they get that first money and they're so excited and you yeah. can see it and you're like, yes, I yeah. did that. Yeah. I mean, cheap thrill for myself. Yeah. But yeah. 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 No, I, I, I can totally relate to this because I, I was telling you, right, I grew up in a single parent household. Um, and I don't think we grew up in a silver spoon sort of a background. And money was like, a, we were living paycheck to paycheck. And I learned this very early on from my mom that, you know, you need to be very organized financially. Mm. You need to plan ahead. You need to think about things. Um, And then you sort of look at money in a different perspective. And I resonate with what you're saying because for me, uh, again, when I married Shamir, one of the things that we had as an agreement is we're never taking loans. Oh, so important. Right? Because then you have no liabilities. Yeah. And again, then you're on a different journey. It's yeah. an experience journey that is very different. You're not obligated to work somewhere or do something because I'm going to get this money and I have a liability. It's against because I enjoy doing this. And I, I love it. Yeah, yeah, that's so important. And also the way we think about money, right? Like I, I remember when I, when I had a loan and I had to pay it off. I mean, every month was stressful because I had to go and think of this interest and then might be calculating. I've paid much more than the, you know, all of those sorts of things. And it was a very stressful. And if I didn't make this money, oh, how yeah. stressful it was. And then the moment you shift that equation and you're like, money is joy and I can share it with other people. Yeah. It's... Do you think men figured this out earlier I don't <laughs> before think us? I, I think we have figured it out. Don't oh, you think? You, uh, I, I don't know. I think uh, I honestly feel men have at least figured some aspects like, you know, investments. Yeah. Um, you know, minimum financials, yeah. uh, planning ahead. Uh, while we are earning and we make our incomes and things like that, I don't think we've understood money as women to its fullest. Um, and I don't think we've mastered it because when you master it, then you know how to keep it in the right place yeah, yeah. and then to experience life differently. Yeah. Is keeping it in the right place is important, yes, right? Because yes. you don't need to be a billionaire or a no, millionaire. I mean, not it's not, it's, it, it doesn't really fundamentally change your experience after yes, a certain point. Yes. As long as you have hot water and constant hot water yes. in your bathroom, so what, you what do you need? So you know what is minimum yeah, that yeah, you need. Yeah. Which, um, and oh. then as long as that minimum is taken care of, then... I have the financial independence mm. to go and explore different things that brings happiness for me, uh, be it a different career path, be it some other educational mm. journey I'm going through, or just taking a break for one year. Mm. I, see, I think men figured out the investment and in the organization of finances because they were sort of raised or brought up to that way, right? They had to have the job and everything else, in our generation yeah. at least. But I don't think they realized that you don't have to earn infinitely. <laughs> that is true. 
that is true. So when yeah. you retire, yeah, 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 it becomes yeah. Yeah. a difficult conversation. Yeah. 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 What will they do? They, a lot of men don't know what to do after they retire. I mean, in my father's generation, I can see a lot of men who just like, what do we do now? Yeah. I've lost that power. Yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. know who Father-in-law I Father-in-law went from project to project. Like, you know, after retirement, first he started off with, I'm going to build a house in uh, Kerala. So that went on for some time. Then that project got over and then he's like, hmm. Now what? <laughs> so there's drip irrigation that started. I'm going to be in agriculture now. So he, he, I don't think they plan for the, uh, no, you know, no. the retirement part it of it. So, so funny. My father retired really high ranking in the Indian government. You know, mm. special secretary to the cabinet secretariat. Huge, like hugely important role. Um, and then retires. And what does he do? He has to look after Sam, his daughter's cats while she travels <laughs> <laughs> from like special secretary cabinet session to cat sitter. But he was so happy as a cat sitter also. I mean, yeah. it brought out a new side of his personality. Yeah. And I think seeing that actually enabled me to realize like you can deal with things differently in life. Yeah. yeah. Again, comes down to being surrounded with the right yeah. set yeah. of people, right? And the mindset. Yeah. yeah. So in this journey, Sam, how do you go about today I'm going to write a book tomorrow i'm going to consult for a startup but the after tomorrow i'm going to write a script for one of the famous movie stars how do you go about how do you i don't <laughs> they just come and then there are months when they're like oh there's no money coming so i better do something i need to like hustle some work so is networking a big part of this or how, yeah. how does this come how does how do opportunities come do you put yourself out there um, and if so, how? It's a bit of both. Mm. I definitely do put myself out there. When people come with me to op- with opportunities, I'm willing to do anything because I want that experience. You don't judge yourself whether I know this, I don't know this. Yeah, or... and I'll be op- open about it. I, I haven't, like I'll go in front of a class. I mean, I remember my first class and said, I don't know how to teach very well. Mm. And you have to help me with help this process. With this. And they'll share your expectations with me. And we'll, like, I'll try. And so it, it is a relationship. You're building relationships. Um, so I think uh, that is... Um, and also not to look at downturns as downturns. Mm. I mean, like, I, you know, my one of my startup contracts ended last month. And that was bringing me a lot of money. Mm. And I remember the moment that we, I mean, we had this discussion and I knew there wasn't much work coming in. And I had started to question whether I had any relevance for this company. And I was the one who initiated the conversation saying, do I have any relevance for you anymore? Mm. Or do you want to let me go? Mm. And also having the courage to do that. To have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I felt it was important for my integrity too. Because I did not want to continue taking a paycheck when I was not contributing anything of value. Yeah. It somehow went against my grain that mm. I need... I need to have a valuable experience of life. And if I continue to take this paycheck and hold myself free for them, I'm not going to have an interesting experience. Yeah. I'm going to be waiting yeah. for something that may may not happen. Yeah. So uh, I think that is also it. Like knowing that the downturn is going to come and yeah, I'm going to go and teach for a couple of weeks in college and make a lot less money. But I'm also going to have a fun time doing it. Hmm. And I have enough financial, I've, I've built enough financial security for myself. And I live a kind of lifestyle that it doesn't matter whether I'm earning that big paycheck or I'm teaching in a college. My lifestyle is standard. It's 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 fairly, it's simple. Mm. It's it's comfortable, but very simple as mm. well. So um, it's just being like, it. some of it comes, but there are moments of drought. Mm. And uh, there are moments of like huge, like everything will come at once. True. So uh, just to being able to navigate that. Um, I'm really grateful for these opportunities, but I also don't say that the the fact that I've had some success defines who I am. I don't know. I don't want to hold that because that can kind of prevent me sometimes from learning. Mm. I need to always learn. Mm. I can't be the complete authority. I need to have confidence in asserting my opinion mm. at times. Mm. But but when you start new, asserting your, uh, yourself is difficult because you're new to that space itself. How do you go about building that confidence to be able to say, hey, by the way, this is my opinion. And it might be different from the mass opinion out there. How do you go about, because um, I think you and I have a common characteristic, which is the job job, job part of it. Right? <laughs> Actually, many things like introvertish, shy, right? And, and yet we're talking about being out there, having mentors, having networking, grabbing opportunities. It sort of is like a... A dichotomy of sorts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I completely get you. I think uh, when I end up in a new situation or place, mm. uh, I think one thing is humility, like it really helps me, is just to say I don't know all of these answers. So it always 
initially to preface it by saying, I guess there are many, many ways of seeing this, or looking at the situation, but this is how I feel about it, or this is what I see. Mm. And, um, you know, what, what, what is the best strategy moving forward? Mm. So I think that really helps. Um, I think developing authentic relationships with people where you are honest, but you're also kind of nurturing. So they also are kind of honest with you. I think this is a great advantage of being a woman. We just woman, being yeah. nurturing just becomes instinctively to us. We've yeah. been trained in it. Yeah. So you can create that safe space. So then people start to respect you more and you can then start to assert your opinion and, and, and more credence is given to you. Um, I found that really helpful in the film industry like mm. because you're dealing with the people who have who are really high up and mm. have a lot of power and then you have to you know create a space where 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 you feel more equal to them. Mm. I think the other thing that really you mentioned networking and um I, f- I found that, you know, on some levels, I'm disastrous at networking. <laughs> like, I, I go to a room and there are all of these people and then I'll find one interesting person and I'll, like, Stick on to them, right? Stick on to them the whole evening. Yeah, and the whole purpose me. is to, like, yes. go around and show some card and have some two-minute... Co- I can't do this. Yes. It's not even fun. Yes. I can't do it. It's like work. It's like uh, <gasps> it's like going to a conference, right? And there's so many people and I'm, like, you would find me. If this room is full of people, I'd be in one corner, just yeah. one person. Yeah. And I feel like that's so much nicer yeah. can I just say like I'll, I'll be my I love going to parties and I love sticking on to that one person and not meeting more than like two people in a night but that's my form of networking and I find ironically like I I may not pick out the most uh, I'm, I'm you know the most important person or mm. thing to, to talk to I mean you will often pair up with someone who feels equally awkward mm. um, but some really beautiful relationships authentic places come out of that yeah so recently i have to draw an analogy um there was a singles mixer event and i'm not single <laughs> but you were there <laughs> but i was there that's another coffee conversation for why i was there both me and my husband were there. Oh. <laughs> but what i learned is again if i draw the analogy to a conference or just going into a room full of people um what i observed is when you go to a singles event um there will be like two or three guys yeah. who are uh, good looking yeah. um, and then who are good narrators yeah. or can engage in a conversation and women flock to that. Uh, probably it's the same story the other yeah. way as well. Um, but it doesn't mean that the others aren't interesting. Yeah. It's just that, <laughs> I know, I you know, know we are so talking. attracted with this. Uh, it's like a magnet that we are attracted to. Um, and I think for us, it's the other way. So we sort of avoid that and we look at these corner cases and say, let's connect. And the wall that's, flowers. <laughs> yeah, so that's where deeper conversations yeah. also come through, right? Yeah. Uh, so being open to that, I guess, is that networking then? I, th- I think so. I feel like it's a networking for me at least. Like I know also those single mixer events you've, you've talked about, right? And then you find, you look at the desperately handsome man and you're like, okay, let me cu- sum up the courage to go over and talk to him. And then he's all, there are already this line of women behind you and you're like, why am I here? And then you feel like measures of ang- anxiety and angst. Well, this is important as a fundamentally human experience. And as a writer, I feel it like I can write about this. Yeah. I'm like, I don't need to go through this again. Yeah. I'm not going through this again. So I, I can't, I, I, to be honest, I hate dating. Yeah. 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 And I, I don't feel like this kind of dating leads to like anything that I really enjoy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, and, and then, you you know, like I, for a long time, because I was that nerdy, unattractive girl in school who had written books. I don't know. Unattractive from which angle? I don't oh, know. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, but I, I was this nerdy, unattractive girl in school and I was um, writing books. And so like, and I was a nerd and, you know, not, not cool at all. And um, so none of the, the good looking boys would ever, you know, like even look in my direction. I mean, it was like uh, that would not happen. And so I had developed so much anger and anxiety around handsome men. Yeah. So I always used to write them off as like pretty faces and mm. never really engage with them. And now in my 30s, I'm suddenly discovering now that all of that has gone. Like there are some handsome men who actually think and are interesting. I was realizing I was doing some reverse discrimination. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, do this yeah. most often. It could be in, in, in dating. It could be in just looking for another job. Yeah. It could just be having that conversation with another manager to say, hey, yeah. I want to try something else. Yeah. We sort of procrastinate because of our own boundaries we set yeah. in our yeah. own minds. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're also talking about is, uh, step back, question some of that, yeah. and then you know there are opportunities, and that's how opportunities mm-hmm. get created. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Interesting. And actually, and I believe in that, and, and I totally believe in that as well, uh, because for me, that's been the journey. Like, uh, I took up three sales in the US, and it was my first landing in that country, and everything was new. The culture was new, the people, uh, the style of talking was new, and I was in pre sales, so it's all alpha. Uh, extrovertish, very much uh, different from the nature that I am coming from. And I came from an engineering and a design background or a research background, and here I am in sales. Um, so I took up radio jockey job. And, uh, you know, I said, I can't do a room full of people, so let me do a one on one. <laughs> and I took up the RG job, and that was the best thing I did because it sort of helps you open up. Yeah. In terms yeah. of, you know, uh, did you go through some journey of that sort where you really tested yourself, took the plunge? I think going to Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah, it was a huge plunge. I was really scared. And then again, you know, I was leading a team. I was really young. Um, I was leading a team of people who, you know, they should resent me. I mean, I'm some outsider who's being brought in. What do I know? Mm. So, but I think I, it really, it did... It was phenomenal. I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful for that experience in my life. It really sh showed me how to move past barriers, move past these boundaries you were talking about in our heads to really, like all work, only can, we only create through relationships. Hmm. Whether it's work, whether it's collaboration, whether it's a family, whatever we create, we create through relationships. So really understanding the importance of that. Hmm. Um, and then realizing that there is a way you don't have to be that alpha. Uh, like you hmm. can be more successful. I mean, you, like why why do we want to hold power why mm. do we want to be that controlling person mm. there's a different way of getting things done power is just getting things done mm. being able to facilitate that mm. yeah but power is beautiful i think that's yeah. what we're <laughs> used to how did afghanistan really happen for you did was that like a job that was out there and you just bumped into it or you went looking for it how did it happen i think multiple things i wanted to go to afghanistan because i had lived some part in that of my life in Pakistan. Pakistan and my father had spent some time in Afghanistan so I was really curious mm. but I think the other thing was um, and I had read about this man called Saad Mosseini he had there was an article about him I think in the New Yorker which really talked about how he was shaping culture through television and radio programming so mm. trying to create a cultural shift um, mm. a more em, you know empowering culture for women a post-Taliban mm. Afghan culture ha I mean there are strong examples of strong women yeah. pre-Taliban yeah. in, in Afghanistan but to bring that culture back after those years um, so I really wanted to go and work with uh, work there, understand that, understand what, the power. What year was this? 2012. Mm. And I applied for a job, didn't get it, then wrote to them again, followed up uh, a year later, and then they had something. Mm. And also, to be honest, like I wasn't making much money as a writer here in India at that time. Mm. And I had this lo large college loan to pay off. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, they're paying me a lot more money to go. Obviously, hardship, you know, in Afghanistan. So, yeah, let me take this. <laughs> yeah. I remember at one point, I actually looked for UN jobs in Afghanistan. Okay, so and, and it was just a thrill of, oh, yeah. a UN job yeah. and I, the diplomatic passport is like a yeah. pretty cool thing to have, I guess. So. <laughs> Yeah, 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 so that's how it started. Yeah, yeah. And you got the job. I got the job. I went there for six months. I felt very sick. I ended up with chronic bronchitis to the point of um, spitting out blood, mm. uh, coughing up blood. So I had to come back to India for treatment, went back, served out my contract. Um, and then at the end of it, I came back and I was sick. And I developed, I started exhibiting PTSD. And I wanted to go back and another contract with the same company and I couldn't. Um, and I, that is also a privilege. There are people who are living there who suffer the same physical and mental health problems who do not have the choice. And especially now, let's, you know, it's yeah. Afghanistan is back under the Taliban. Yeah. Uh, it, is, it is disastrous. It is horrific. But um, I had the option of leaving mm. and, and people there don't. But that also put me on this journey to understand the relationship between culture and mental health mm. and cycles of violence and cycles of trauma. Mm. Um, this this is a culture that, that has been reeling under PTSD and the trauma of, of war. And, you know, it, it is, it is a, a reoccurring pattern there. Mm. Um, so to understand the relation, that is a culture that is under sort of mass PTSD. So mm. under, to understand that and the relationship with narrative and how narratives can... Storytelling can create catharsis, can create healing. Mm. That has been a really important journey for me now. It's also about important. then empathy oh. at the core of it, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, 
I remember and and emp- how empathy can and storytelling and even commercial mm. storytelling yeah. all link up together. Yeah. Um, I remember this moment when I was trying to figure out what would be successful. I was, I was you know, head scriptwriter for a TV series and what do I know about Afghanistan or mm. Afghan television? So I went to see the head of broadcast, uh, and I said, you know, I don't. And the joke in the um, lunchroom was, uh, if this man's mother's cry mm. cries. This this show is going to get the prime time TV slot because there are no T- TRPs, there are no such indicators at that mm. time. So I was like, this is just a joke. Why does his mother have to cry? And then I went to him and I spoke to him, and what he said was, this culture has gone gone under mass loss. Right? Mm. There are people who have lived and lost their entire families, watched generation of you know husbands and f- sons and daughters and all lost to all war, lost, and yeah. you know again and again and again, and they have developed this thick armor around their hearts. Mm. This this hard heartedness and this hard heartedness is also the root of the problem. Mm. This lack of empathy, mm. you know. Mm. So how do we? But it is caused by grief that has not been healed. Mm. Um, the reason people have to cry, or we have to leave TV, create TV shows that make people cry, is for them to release this emotion, to free themselves from this burden of grief, and that is how healing will happen here. It's profound. Yeah, that's a different perspective itself, right? To yeah. Is that what Ekta Kapoor follows here? Uh, you'll have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Kyuki Saspi Kabhi Bahuti was hugely popular in Afghanistan. Oh, really? Yeah, cabinet meetings used to be rescheduled so the cabinet ministers could run back in time to watch it. And then there was this, uh, the TV station that I worked for was the one that was broadcasting this for a number of years. Mm. And the voiceover artist who dubbed the rule of Tulsi mm. into uh, Dari, she became so popular, her voice became so famous in Afghanistan, she changed her name to Tulsi. And then stood for election, oh, and lost, but still. Um, interesting how TV influences across cultures, yeah. right? We yeah. both, I mean, how many? I mean, not just here, but Everything. Afghanistan, Ronald Reagan, all of this. Yeah. Was that a proper expat community you were living in in Afghanistan? So, uh, I'll tell you where I'm going with this question, right? When you travel to different places, even on work, oftentimes it's up to you whether you put in the effort to blend into the culture, to know the culture better, to go beyond the safe spaces, because you're going either, you know, in a very guarded bubble of your own, um, and to really experience a culture, you have to step out. And that could be scary, that could be a different experience itself. So was your experience in Afghanistan more like a bubble, or were you able to sort of mix with the culture out there and were there learnings that you came back with? I wish I'd done more of the mixing with the culture. I did more of it than many expats there do. Mm. But to be honest, I also did spend a lot of time in the expat bubble. Mm. Um, And there are also various shades and degrees to the expat bubble. So like um, there are a huge number of Afghans who have spent years in Canada and the US who had come back and were sort of part of this expat or kind of on this fringe of this expat bubble. Uh, So for me, actually, I got along very well with them because I also kind of, you know, had this upbringing, you know, multicultural upbringing. Um, many of them had spent a couple of years in, mo- a lot of Afghans have spent years in Pakistan or India. Mm. So this whole, you know, Urdu or Hindi, very they're very comfortable with it. They know Indian Bollywood things. So there's automatically, as an Indian girl going in, you immediately meet with a lot of warmth and mm. generosity. It's a hugely generous country, culture. Mm. So I did experience all of that, which is very different from, say, an American going in and what they would experience. And their level of safety is different. I can pass off under a hijab, I pass off as Afghan. Um, so that gave me a level of ease to also mix, meet people, mix with them, speak to them in Hindi and Urdu. You know, that kind of um, difference was there. So that was a very different experience. I shared a house, I was living in a house with five Pakistani accountants. So <laughs> It's a bizarre, bizarre life hmm. there. But yeah, um, I, uh, it it uh, so I I did experience it in a different way. But I wish I had also stepped out more of my out of my bubble. And of course, I worked in an office where, you know, I was working with a complete like a like a, a num my the team I was working with was Afghan, hmm. know, but from different um, ethnicities. You had Tajiks and Pashtuns and Hazaras, and you were. You started to actually, through that, understand the complexities. So, in some ways, this has been the extreme adverse living that you went into. And you came back um, discovering yourself, but at the same time, also sort of 
experiencing pain or you know looking at the other side of you know what privilege doesn't normally show you how has that shaped you post that because it's been quite a mm. while post that that you've been out here how has that shaped you both on a personal front as well as um on a work front oh uh, hugely i mean i came back with post traumatic stress disorder to admit that is a failure mm. right now what did i experience i was there for like Six seven months. I yeah. mean, w- did I suffer really? Mm. I mean, imagine someone who's lived there their entire life, uh, and then you know to experience um, to not sleep for a couple of years, um, and that really leading me down this journey of, you know, to have have those constant nightmares and those hallucinations, and to even think about suicide because you can't escape that. Mm. Um, and then to go down and I mean I, that's one of the reasons I spent the last two years um, studying psychotherapy. Psychotherapy, yeah. Uh, It, it, you know, really incidentally, one. that's one area that I think I've been telling, um, you know, even in the office and at home also. I want to get into really studying psych- psychology and more the behavioral cognitive psychology part of it, because it's it sort of then opens your perspective itself, right? Yeah, yeah, hugely. I'm I'm great grateful for. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for my th- for therapy as well. I mean, mm. therapy is not just about. it's about healing and it's also about transformation mm. to adapt to any situation you need to transform mm. yeah and how has that impacted your work hugely um i mean i think i grew up with a father who was in the government service and you know had this retirement fund you know pension and this is the kind of you know what i was brought up for with thinking about in mm. terms of a career to be able to break out of that and see this kind of weird gamut spectrum cloud of careers that i carry with me as as legitimate mm. i need a therapy for that i need a therapy to change my relationship with money um oh also with my acceptance of myself as a single woman in india which is which has been challenging mm. um all of those things yeah and has that uh, opened up new avenues for work like you know are there um scripts like is is a script that you're writing influenced by what happened or what you experienced or, or has your writing style changed your storytelling t- style changed yeah. or have you looked at a completely different line itself I mean I think a post Afghanistan what I've really been interested in is storytelling as healing so psychotherapy really helps me understand that and how that can be possible mm. um through the stories we tell how can we attempt to heal or transform mm. or create new storytelling as an instrument of change mm. so that has been really um a huge hugely important part of part of it as well but I think also you know I can see the effects of it in you know I teach mm. so how I how I create a nurturing space how I nurture talent the fact that I have students who win awards I mean like and and hugely important ones i mean i don't think it's uh i i, I don't think i'm I, i am lucky that i have great students and very committed but it is how do you create that in atmosphere in a classroom and and if lots of students are capable of this it's yeah. just how do you create that and i think uh, a lot of what i've been learning through psychotherapy has given me the tools to figure that out has your self talk changed as well in this process yeah <laughs> the other day I had to allow myself to be a narcissist. <laughs> I said I am going to go into this financial negotiation and be completely selfish and a narcissist. <laughs> and it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It does, right? It does change a lot. And 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 it's very important that you know how you look at yourself and how what's the language mm-hmm. you use, the tone you use and how you talk to yourself. Mm-hmm. Um I remember it was my daughter I think who told me would you have this kind of conversation that you're talking to yourself with let's say me? uh i said no then why are you allowing it yeah. with yourself i think she was very young at that time i have this habit of calling myself a dear stupid yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> i know exactly what you're talking about <laughs> oh fool i should have seen that coming i know right <laughs> when i see that happening before yeah i i totally resonate with that so that's yeah. changed for you a lot yeah also the, the the confidence that you can you know like failure doesn't matter it is okay. i mean it, it's okay it's okay it's okay Yeah. yeah when you when you learn to accept that about yourself and about life yeah and everyone is equally foolish yeah yeah i've seen some really powerful people be incredibly foolish so so what's future for you sam uh, i think i'm entering more into the film industry now so that's going to be interesting i also feel very uncomfortable doing it mm. um because I some, sometimes i feel like i have more value as a teacher mm. but i have to also let my like hold that in in its space and be like let me also enjoy this and see a way i can bring my students along with me if that's possible so we probably changed the script writing 
<laughs> you'll probably disrupt that i think uh, <laughs> that's putting a tall order on me <laughs> because really i think uh, it does need some disruption yeah, it does need some disruption i don't know if i'm if i will be in that position to be able to do that mm. but it would be great because i think um there are many different kinds of stories we need stories that reflect ourselves yes Yes. And and this younger generation particularly it's important for them to see new ideas of success to see new models of leadership yeah that can really change the future I mean yeah. that would be a reason to disrupt the system yeah Well Sam thank you so much it was a lovely conversation I hope you had a good time as much as I did uh but thank you yes, so I much Yes I have thank you <laughs> I've really enjoyed this conversation it's it's been wonderful to have it with you, you oh, know, like this the shared similarity Thank you so much <laughs> Thank you